We're in a series called Commit. And I hope that the phrase you walk away from this with is, your life is formed by the commitments you make and keep. And as corollaries, we also added the commitments you make and don't keep, or the commitments you don't make because you're afraid. But your life is formed around commitments. And so we're challenging you in this January season to think about what is my life about and what am I committed to and how quickly do I get pushed off of those commitments. And so we've challenged you to be committed to Christ, first of all. Jesus said, if you don't love me above everything, you can't be my disciple. That he takes first place and there's nobody else on the God shelf. And then if I'm committed to Christ, then I'm committed to his cause. It means why I'm here in this world is to see people come out of darkness into light, to see people come to a relationship with Christ. And that cause becomes priority to me. And if I'm committed to the cause of Christ, then I need to be committed to the church of Christ, the community that comes together because I can't possibly do it by myself. And I need people to stir up and encourage me. And in the, uh, the, in the program that you got today, there is something that we don't usually put in there, and that is the, it's called a membership commitment. And the idea is that we are challenging those of you who are already members to look at why you are here and commit to, again, the, the core reasons why we're here together. And if you're not yet a member, we invite you to sign that and to come to a class, and we're, at least at the Sutherland campus, we're going to have a class, and walk into saying, what does it mean to really commit and say, I'm part of family church? Because we find that it means you know you belong, and then it also means we know you belong, and we can go forward together as a united force. So this is a time when we're challenging your commitments. And we talked about, two weeks ago, the fact that when you first come to church, you are often coming because of a need that you have. So you're committed to a lower story. You're committed to a program that's maybe really meeting a need in your life, whether it's getting over a hurt or recovering from an addiction, or maybe you've gone through a divorce, or, or you're just in, new in the area and you need connections. But you come because there's something that meets some needs. And then hopefully, you stay because you like the way that the Scripture's taught, you like leaders who are here, you're connected to people in the church family, not only those who are leading, but you also find some friends. Usually the people that sit in the section with you or the people who live in your neighborhood or the people whose life group you're a part of, because people don't just want a friendly church, they want friends. And so you make those connections. And then sometimes it just becomes that this familiar place of coming together and worshiping and and I remember the first weekend we were in this building, it felt so odd to be the same church because the church is the people, not the building. But it was weird. And somebody said, you know, it's like after enough worship gets splashed on the walls, it feels like home. <laughs> kind of like when you go home and you've, mo- or you've moved into a new house, but you haven't put the pictures up yet. You know, it doesn't quite feel like home. And so those are the reasons people often begin a church connection. And there's nothing wrong with those reasons. Those are great reasons. But hopefully, as you mature in the Lord and as you grow in your relationship with this idea of being committed to the cause of Christ, you begin to come because you are committed to upper story things. You are committed to the mission of the church. I want to come to family church because I believe that it's people helping people find and follow Jesus. And that's what I'm about, and I believe that this church is making a difference in the community, and I I see an emphasis on the same things Jesus talked about, and that's what I want my life to be about. So I want to hang around with people who are doing that. And and this is the funny part. You may not always like the personalities. (laughs) Some of the programs are going to get cut. Some of the other programs you may not like are going to get started. You may or may not like the music. Some of the people will irritate you. So people who are only looking for a honeymoon will hop from church to church to church. But people who begin to say, my life is about being on mission and I want to find other people that I can do that with, even if the church isn't perfect. And I always tell you, if you find a perfect church, do not join it. You would destroy it. (laughs) All right? We're just fallible people working together. And we have some values that we are working toward We are not bragging and saying we've got this all together. We're saying this is who we want to become more and more and more. And so that lets you know the direction we're headed. And hopefully you believe that you're not about one person, but you're about a sense that there's a trusted leadership that is following God and trying to lead as best they can. And it is a process always of learning and developing. 
So hopefully, as you go to family church for a period of time, your loyalties and your commitment begin to shift from what's in it for me to I'm in it for him. And this is a group of people I can do that together with, and I'm committed here. So that's part of the shift that we are encouraging you. And as a part of that, we are talking about our values. What is it that we believe that we are trying to be as we help people find and follow Jesus? And so last week, Pastor Zach talked about the first two. We believe in transformation. Not just conforming to a list of rules, not just giving in to peer pressure of a church body, but being transformed from the inside by the Spirit of God and being new because of Jesus' life in us. And that comes also in this context of community, of relationships. And one of the favorite lines from last week's message for me was, Zach said, we are hurt in relationships, but God uses relationships to heal us also. That being a mature believer is not being a hermit back in a cave somewhere. It's about these interactions and learning to get along with real people and learning to to be encouraged and encourage others. And then we're going to talk about two more values. And innovation is probably the hardest one to describe and help you see why it's important. And then we talk about multiplication, which is, I'm afraid, the truth that the church has lost hold of in general. So we're going to talk about those two values. In order, the goal is that you begin to say, I'm committed to those things. I want to be part of this. I want to be a unified, connected, functioning part of this body. I want to be a team member. So, why should we be innovative? Well, I looked everywhere this week to find myself a leisure suit out of the 70s. Because I was going to stand up here and preach to you in a leisure suit. And if you could have seen me when I had the platform heels and a full fro hair... And my wife said, I simply could not listen to you for 30 minutes if you were dressed like that. (laughs) So why do we need to innovate? Well, you may remember leisure suits. What about avocado green appliances? How many of you had avocado green appliances at one point in your life? Yeah. How about Harvest Gold? You remember that era? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you have it anymore? What about that orange shag carpet? <laughs> now, now, if you were going to go buy a home and you were looking at it and it looks like this, what is the first thought in your mind? <laughs> we're going to have to update this puppy, right? So, what if you came into a church that was like that? What if you came into a church that was perfectly formed to reach people in the 50s? which would make a great museum. What does that say? You see, the the culture that we're in says the Bible's old-fashioned and God's out of date and he doesn't understand modern times. And if they come into a church that bears some resemblance to that, it doesn't help them here. So what we believe about innovation, and every time we say it, people get a little weird, like, oh, are you going to change the truth? So, So here's the term I've chosen. We practice creative redundancy. Four of you that know that word really enjoyed that. What does redundancy mean? It means you're saying the same thing, but we're doing it in a different way. You see, I could stand up here and read to you John chapter 3 every day, every time you came, and it would be absolutely the truth. Or I could read Romans chapter 8 every time we came. What would happen soon? You'd, You'd not listen anymore. It would become just the same old thing. Redundancy is the idea of saying the same thing again. So if you say a pair of twins, you just said the same basic thing again. Because the twins are two and a pair is two. It's like in the old Gilligan's Island, you remember when the professor used to say, there was a detonation in the lagoon. And Gilligan would run up and say, there was a big bang too. (laughs) Because he didn't understand the words that the professor had said. And what we want to do is to continue to talk about the gospel and about God and who he is and about the the foundations of the faith. But we want to do it in a way that it engages and encourages and relates to people who are struggling with 2020. So innovation is not about getting soft on the gospel. It's not about moving away from the scriptures. It's about 
teaching them and talking about them and living them out in a way that is highly connected to the people of our era. So this idea of creative redundancy means that we are going to innovate in order to be effective. See, the purpose is not just to do cool new things any more than it should be our purpose to do cool old things. See, new isn't good and old isn't good. Good is good. And what does it mean to be effective? Are people coming to know who Jesus is and committing their life to him, getting baptized, following Christ, getting born again, and are they growing to spiritual maturity? That's effective. And churches are lousy at asking the question, is this working? We ask the questions, do people like it? We ask the questions, are people coming? We ask the questions, is the money coming in? We ask questions like that, but it's hard to ask questions like, is this helping people become more like Jesus? It's a little squishier. It's a little harder to get your fingers around. And so we want to be about being effective. And Jesus, as you realize, said, beware the traditions of men. Because it's an irony that the high and holy creator of the universe and the son of God came to earth. The one who had given the law got in trouble for not keeping enough of the rules. Isn't that an irony? That Jesus was continually in trouble with the religious authorities because he wasn't keeping all the rules that they had set up and that they had tied in and that they had emphasized, Jesus said, more than the commands of God. And so in Mark chapter 7, he says, and you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. You see, we can fall in love with old traditions. It's a nostalgic thing. It makes us feel good. And we come and we say, oh, I feel wonderful that's not effective. Effective, it does make me want to be more like Jesus. Does it cause me to confess sins? Does it maybe you want to pray for my unsaved neighbors? Does it change how I am in terms of the mission? Or does it just make me feel good? And this is maybe a strong word, but I think if it just makes you feel good, it's called entertainment. And we need to be careful that we are not doing new things for entertainment or old things for entertainment. We need to be doing what's effective. And let me tell you, that's hard to measure. It's hard, and the way you do it is you keep coming back at it again and again. And I want to read you Paul's mission verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, who had been a killer of Christians, and God had totally interrupted his life and brought him to not only be a follower of Jesus, but to be a proclaimer of who Jesus was to the world. And you kind of, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you get the heartbeat. And we're going to look at this a little more deeply, but I just want to cherry pick one verse out of it. Verse 22, he says, To the weak I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Did you catch the repeated word in that short verse? I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to build the bridge to people who don't yet understand because it's my privilege to present to them the gospel in a form that they can get. I become all things to all men so that by all means I might save some. And so this idea that we need to be continually looking at not only innovation in the church, we need to be looking at fresh spirituality in our own lives. Because in, it first of all starts personally and then it moves to the church. So let me back up and just read this whole passage that we just pulled that verse out of. Paul says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. That's the title of the message this weekend. To win as many as possible. Paul is passionate about this. He's given his life already. And the cool part is when he's already done a whole lot of good work, he doesn't slow down at the end. He keeps kicking to the tape. And he says, I want to win as many as possible. I'm not a slave. Christ set me free. But I have surrendered my life so that I can do what he's called me to do. And then he says, to the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. So what does that mean? That means when... You know, Paul grew up in a Jewish home, so he knew all the things to do. So when he went to a person's home that was Jewish, he didn't ask for a ham sandwich, okay? 
He, he knew that they don't eat milk and meat together. He knew that they had this way of washing their hands before the meals. They, they have all these little rules. And he just fit in with that culture. Why? Because to fight about ridiculous things keeps you from talking about the important things. And so he said, when I'm in a Jewish home, I come in and I fit and I am Jewish to them. Although he says, I really am not under the law because the law couldn't save me. I had to have Jesus save me. I tried the law to the to the utmost degree, I tried it, and I couldn't get there. And then he says, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So he said, if I go to the Gentiles' home, and they put a ham sandwich in front of me, I'm going to dip it in milk, and I'm going to eat it happily. <laughs> Why? Because that's the Gentile culture. They don't understand all the rules and all the background and all that stuff. It's not important to them. So what if Paul comes in and tries to be Jewish in a Gentile culture? You fight about stupid things and you, kill, you don't get to the main thing. And he says, I am not free from God's law. He says, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to sin. I'm not moving away from God's control. But he said, all those little rules that they've added, I'm not going to be worried about those when I'm in front of a Gentile. And then he says, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak. Some people, he says, are weak in faith. They can't eat meat because they think it might have been offered to an idol and that, that, that hurts their conscience or they can't have any alcohol because it's been a problem for them. And so when I come into a home of somebody who has an addiction problem, I don't open a beer and say, hey, let's drink up. Why? Because that's a weakness in their spiritual journey and I don't want to hurt them. So I flex to fit the people I'm trying to share with. That's what innovation means. It's my responsibility as the mature one who has the gospel, who has the truth. It's my job to build the bridge, not their job to come find me. And then he says, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And if there was anybody who knew what he was talking about, about this, it was Paul. He went to all kinds of different villages, all kinds of different cultures. Sometimes it was Greek, sometimes it was Roman, sometimes it was Jewish. And he went all the way through. And every point he said, as many people as I can reach, that's what I want to do. Whatever it takes. I will tell you, this makes you often uncomfortable. Because all of us like to do what we're used to. All of us like to live within our norm. And, and the older you get, the easier it is to stay in your traces. Some people might call it a rut. And Paul said here at the end of his life, I am still pressing to make an impact, to make a difference so that I might reach some. And then he goes on and he says, I do this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. You see, this isn't, this isn't just change for change's sake. This is change to be effective. And I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of praying for someone and then see them come to a place where they acknowledge who Jesus is and they find out what a great savior he is. And you have the privilege of praying with them when they give their life to Christ. And maybe you even have the privilege of sharing and baptizing them. I don't know if you have the privilege to do that yet, but I wish that for every one of you. To be there with somebody and know that now they've moved from darkness to light. That now they were headed to, they were, before they were headed to hell and now they're headed to heaven. What a place to be. You see, we get so, so focused on things that don't matter and don't last. And we often neglect the things that really matter and really last. And so innovation means that it has to become, first of all, personal and then church-wide. The church is not a building. Agreed? This building could get torn down and we could meet somewhere else and we would be the church. The church is the people. So if people are stuck, then the church is stuck. So, first of all, innovation, that stirring up of the Spirit of God to give you that spirit that Paul has that I want to do whatever it takes. I will flex my life to fit the lives of the people we're trying to reach and trying to disciple and trying to encourage. And I'm going to do that, first of all, because I need personal renewal. What does that mean? That means some of you need to make a strong commitment to be in church together with us. Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling together. Why? Because a coal out by itself tends to go out. We, tend, we need to be together. We need to have our hearts stirred. We need to have other people that challenge us. We need to have examples. 
And it's very interesting. They, they say the polls in America show that church attendance has dropped by about 15 to 20 percent in the last couple of years. And they found that most of it has to do not with people leaving the church, but with people coming to church less often. And, and my joke is I always wish people came as often as they say they do. So people say, well, I'm there all the time. Hmm, interesting. Haven't seen you quite a bit. Why? Because we need to be stirred up, and sometimes that comes from other ways, other people that pour into us. Sometimes it comes from reading your Bible in a little different way. If you've been doing the same thing and the same style of reading and the same number of verses and the same kind of devotional plan, maybe you need to go on to your Bible app, which we use the YouVersion Bible app, and find one of the Bible plans and, and read a new one. And it's kind of fun. You can do it with other people, and you can see their comments, and you can, read your, you can put your comments on for what God's speaking to you about. And maybe you need to do some prayer time in a little different way. And maybe you just need to get away from all the electronics and go and spend some time and seek God. I don't know what it will be for you, but it's important. Because we have to have personal stirring up of our hearts regularly. I need it. Because after a while, you just start phoning it in. And it becomes a going through the motions devotions instead of an adoration of Jesus. And so we need stirred up personally. And then when you're stirred up personally, then it helps the church be stirred up. Why? Because I will guarantee you that if you come to church with a brand new friend of yours that's not yet a follower of Jesus and you've been having coffee with them and you've been telling them about Jesus and you come and you sit in church with them, you will sit completely different than you did when you were here by yourself. You're going to say, Paul, don't say dumb stuff. Please, please. Don't be offensive, and oh, I hope that song, I hope they like that. You know, we get, we get so worried about how people respond, and the good thing is that God calls people in spite of all of this, and he draws them to himself. But let me give you a mind-blowing idea. What if you came to church every weekend because it was a priority, and you did it not only to get something, but to give something? What if you just had that simple idea, that you came not only to hear and to be challenged and be stirred up, but you needed to pray with somebody or you needed to sit down with somebody that was hurting or you needed to, to invite somebody out to coffee afterwards so you could build a relationship or maybe you needed to help somebody answer a question or just help somebody in the church body. What if you came with the intent of God, I want to get and I want to give? You see, why often we come as though this is a show instead of as a place to let God's spirit fill us up and challenge us. So we need to be stirred up individually and we need to be stirred up as a church body because that's what will make us effective in reaching people for Christ. And then, this looks like on that sheet that you've got, that church recommitment sheet. And if you are already a member, we just want you to look at it and say, yeah, this is what I'm committed to. And if you're not yet a member, we are inviting you in. Somebody said to me, what if I don't want to become a member? We're going to kick you out, clearly. That's exactly what I'm saying. I want to be crystal clear. You're coming, you're not even maybe a follower of Jesus, or maybe you have a thing about membership, or you've been hurt in a church, and you're still working through that. We're not going to treat you any differently. We're glad that you're here. This is just an invitation for some of you who've been here a while to step up and say, I'm going to be more committed than I've been before. And so some of the specifics. I'll seek to follow God's fresh leading daily. How often do you need to be stirred? <laughs> At least daily. And then... I'll lay down my personal preferences about ministry and be open to new strategies and ideas for reaching and growing people as God leads us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit trying to run the church program and I'm going to let God do that and pray for the leaders and I'll give my input, but I'm not going to try to control it all. I'll look for new ways to influence the people in my life towards Christ, which leads us to the second one we're talking about today, the fourth value, which is multiplication. Intentional multiplication And that means that as a church, we need to move from addition, adding a few people here and there, to multiplication. And I want to tell you a sad statistic I read. It said that a church that is fairly evangelistic, like a church that is fairly new, is is more effective at reaching out. But churches that are more established get less and less effective at evangelism. A brand new church plant will reach something like 19 people in the congregation for one person that gets reached for Christ. Now, to me, that does not sound like a good number. But a church that's 40 or 50 years old, it takes 50 people in the church body 
to reach one person? Why do we become less effective the longer we're going to church? I think it's because we are getting into our Christian holy bubble and we're losing connection and maybe we're losing this simple idea that Paul shares. He says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. This is the missing idea of the American church. It's working great in India and China and Korea, but the church has lost it because we think the church is a building where you come and sit and listen. And Paul says, let me tell you, God has poured into me and people have poured into me and now I, Timothy, have developed a relationship with you and I've been pouring into you and now Timothy is a young pastor in the church of Ephesus. And Paul's pouring into him and he says, let me tell you how this works. Just like Jesus did, he dealt with the multitudes, but he picked 12 and he poured into them. Just like Paul did, he poured into Timothy and Titus and Epaphroditus and he poured into these guys who would then teach others. And Paul said, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Be looking for people who are going to pass it on to somebody else. At the very beginning, you look for the, you tell them, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to pour into you for a period of time, and then you're going to pour into some others. So what happens even in churches that are fairly effective at growing addition, 43% tend to come just from other churches coming, already come to Christ, but they're just switching churches. And sometimes there's some valid reasons for that, and sometimes there's just a, A desire to always have something new and fresh and not work on hard relationships. And then people who have been unchurched and those who are de-churched make up about 40%. But the goal, Paul says, is that we need to reach people who don't know Jesus. So it's a very, very simple idea graphically. One person spends time and focuses on reaching two people and they each start reaching somebody else and they pour into that idea that when we're done meeting together, you're going to pour into somebody else. I'm delighted that both the men's and women's ministries are now moving from events where a lot of people come and sit to this idea of how do we pour into each other's lives? How do we sharpen each other? How do we do this very simple thing? And let me show you how effective it can be. So here's the addition standard. If you are a sincere follower of Jesus and you share with people about Jesus and you get to lead somebody to Christ every single year. Unfortunately, that's not even what usually happens. But if that were to happen, at the end of 15 years, how many would be there? You guys are sharp. (laughs) So even if we take that to the next level, say you could be like an incredible evangelist and you led a person to the Lord every day. At the end of the 15 years, it'd be 5,000. But let me show you what happens when multiplication becomes the process. So the first year, you spend time with two people and you pour into them, and you come to the place where they are following Christ, and they're understanding the scriptures, and then they begin to have this passion to help pray for other people that aren't yet believers, and follow up with them. And at the next year, there's four, and the next year, there's eight, and the next year, there's 16. Doesn't sound like it's going. It doesn't sound near as impressive as this. What do you think, if you follow that process for 15 years, how many disciples of Jesus do you think you would have? Take a guess. 32,000. Why? Because multiplication works better than addition. And that's the secret that the church has lost. That we have, have some parachurch ministries that do that, but we don't consider that normal in the church. And what if you were just to meet with one person for six months with the idea that you were going to pour into them so that you could encourage them to find somebody to pour into? It's not a, it's not a mind-blowing idea but it's a life-changing idea. What if we became a church of multiplication? And let me tell you a couple things I think that means. I think it means, first of all, we need to have a new commitment to the children and the students that are here at Family Church. My heart's been broken recently by people that are friends of mine who have raised their kids in the church and now their kids are grown up and some of them are atheists and some of them have walked away from the church and some of them are doing nothing with their faith. And you know, it'd be terrible if we won the whole world and lost our families, wouldn't it? And so what does that mean? It means that we as parents and family members need to pour into our children. It also means that we as a church family 
need to care about our children. You know, the, the statistics say if a kid has seven significant adult relationships, they will be healthy, they will do well. What if those seven were people that met them at church and got down at their level and talked to them so that church was the most exciting thing they could do all week? Why? Because people love me there, because people care about me. What if we could be Jesus to our children and our young adults? And, and let me just say, we're at a place right now where it's hard to find people to serve in the nursery. It's hard to find people that have a passion for teaching children. And I believe part of it's because we lost the focus on, first of all, we need to make disciples in-house. And we need people who will rise up and say, that is worth giving my life to. I'm going to do that. Not once in a while if you catch me and I can't say no. But I need passion for that. Let me tell you how this works in my life. My mom was a Bible teacher before she was ever married. And so she is still a Bible teacher. And she spent many years pouring into people through classes. And, and when she had one kid, she just took me along with her. And I became just an addendum. And when she had two kids, she could bundle us both up and take us and when she got three kids, she said, I died. <laughs> because you have to run zone after you get to three, you know. And she said, I had to stay home. And she said, I felt disappointed and I couldn't do what I had been doing that had been so what God had led her into. She said, God impressed her that her time now was not to teach Bible stories and not teach Bible lessons, but to create Bible teachers. And one of them is standing right here today because of that sacrifice and because of that pouring. And all of her kids became Bible teachers at some level. See, that matters, doesn't it? How do you be effective in 50 years instead of just this year? And that's how it is. So we need to make a new commitment, parents and grandparents, to our own families, but also to the kids around us. There's neighborhood kids that come here that have no family that loves Jesus. They ought to find a family here. It means that I need to be incarnational in my circle. I don't believe that God puts you in your neighborhood by accident. I don't believe that he puts you in your job by accident. I don't believe you're in the school that you are in by accident. Incarnational means that I'm not just going to tell people about Jesus. It means I'm going to go and try to show Jesus there. I'm going to be Jesus to my world. And it's exciting. Some of the life groups are beginning to form in places where people are at business and at teachers who are at school and police officers who are together with other police officers and, and they're beginning to say, we need to be Jesus to our sphere, to our circle. And I hope you're praying about some people who are not yet followers of Jesus in your area. And then I want to help people come to maturity. Just getting them across the line where they give their lives to Christ is the beginning it's not the end. That I need to pour into them until they have enough to be able to pour into somebody else. And you know, it always frosts me that people who've been in church for years say, well, I don't know enough to disciple somebody. And I guess, what have we been doing if you don't know enough? And the reality is you do know enough, you're just scared. And it is messy. Working with people is messy because what I always tell you is people are Weird. But that's okay, you're weird too, and maybe you'll find a way to connect. So what does it say on that sheet we're trying to recommit to? I'll pray for spiritual seekers in my life, and I'll seek to know them. I need to get to know them and let them see Jesus. I'm going to build the bridge to where their world is. Doesn't mean I see in it, doesn't mean I go involve myself in sinful things. It means I'm going to bridge to their world. And then it means I'll regularly engage people in spiritual conversations. How do you talk to people about spiritual things? Well, I'll tell you a secret. Anytime you start talking about real things, there's a spiritual root. You want to talk about marriage, there's a spiritual root. You want to talk about parenting, there's a spiritual root. You want to talk about the mess our world is in, yeah, there's a spiritual answer to those things. And learn to be able to move those into conversation. I'll invite people into my life and into the church body. I think in the past we made too much emphasis on you inviting them to church. Some people are not ready for us yet. They need to go to coffee with you. They need to hear about your life. They need to have you share what God's doing in you. And then maybe they can get brave enough to come into this scary place with all you scary people. I always ensure people we have big beams that'll hold up. You don't need to worry about any crashing, okay? And then the last one, I'll spend intentional time helping people grow. 
You see, sometimes we make discipleship way too scary. It's just meeting regularly with somebody and helping them grow. And you know what? When you begin to pour into somebody's life and help them grow, who's going to grow more? You will. This is how you get mature. And when you have a church where it takes 50 people to lead one person to the Lord, that's not spiritual maturity. That's called church stuckness. That's an official word. And we want to be mature and not stuck. We want to follow Christ, don't we? So let me challenge you that God stir you up so that we can be a church that is stirred up and effective. I'm going to hand off to our campuses in green and to our campus at South Umqua. And love you guys. You walk through these next couple steps. I believe that innovation begins with you. Romans chapter 12 says, don't lose your spiritual fervor, your spiritual steam. It is my responsibility to keep my spiritual heart stirred up. It's not the church's job, it's not the pastor's job, it's my job. And there's a lot of people that can help you. And you have more access to spiritual material than has ever been on the face of the earth. The question is, are you using it to stir your life and to create a deeper discipleship in you? And then... I would invite you to consider those of you who are members already, just sign that sheet and say, yes, I'm recommitting to these things. This is what I'm about. This is important. This is what it means to be a disciple. And you can take those and you can put them in the giving box or you can hand them to me or you can um, have have them picked up when the connect cards are picked up. And if you're not a member, you haven't gone through that process then I invite you just to sign that and we will send you an invitation. There's two classes that are coming up called Connecting Classes and we'd love to have you come because then you can ask questions and we can walk through any things that that might be hindering you from saying, I want to be a part of that team. And the goal through all this is that God would stir us up as a church family so that we'd be more effective at helping people find and follow Jesus because that's the scorecard more than anything else. So let me encourage you to decide what it is that God is saying to you from that. And if you're just visiting with us, I hope this has challenged you to be more committed to your life in Christ. And if you're from another church family, that get more committed there. Because it's not about our church, it's about his church, right? Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the challenging words from the life of Paul, who lived out his mission. And God, help us to be honest about where we are still failing, where we are still falling short, where we need to be stirred up and renewed and recommitted. And God, we even can't keep our own commitments except by the power of your Spirit within us. So Paul says to Timothy, be strong in the grace. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for what you do in us that we can't do in ourselves. Help us to surrender to you and trust that you know what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.